you can't cure jet lag. There are no cures right now. But if you understand how it works, you sort of can hack the system a little bit. What we know is that for every day that you've been in a new time zone, your body can actually catch up by about one hour. So that sort of extra day basically acts like a set of fingers on a wristwatch, and it will just kind of tweak it one hour every day. So I am now four days in. I am only offset by four hours relative to California time. Normally, I'm offset by a total of eight hours. I've been here four days, one hour for every day. I'm now four hours separated. That would be the classic case if you just sort of let passage of time work. However, you can speed up that. Sort of tweak. You can get those fingers to work harder on the wristwatch dial. Sort of get closer and faster to the natural new time zone. In the following ways, firstly, you should get lots of daylight exposure in the morning in the new time zone. So whenever you arrive, and then for all of the days afterwards, make sure that you get about twenty to thirty minutes of natural daylight.、It、doesn't matter if it's cloudy; just that brightness alone is key. If you do go outside, the temptation is to put shades on. Don't do that. Even even if it looks, you know, you look fantastic and you look very cool. <laughs> Just for the morning, all I would ask you is don't put shades on because it will diminish that light reset function. Because it's light that's going to help reset and fast forward that clock. The other critical thing is diet or at least eating. Food is just as powerful a trigger for resetting your circadian rhythm as light is. We only discovered this probably about sort of eight or nine years ago, and so start eating meals at the regular times in the new time zone. Eat when everyone else is eating. Don't eat when you your body tells you that you're hungry. It's harder to do, but that will help you get back into set as well. The other trick, however, is that if you go out in the afternoon. Um, that's fine, no problem at all. But the afternoon is the time to wear shades. That's the time to start blocking the light, to start to force your body to think it's night time, it's darkness. Even though your body clock, California for me, is just starting to wake up, I need to shroud my brain in darkness to try and help reset it. So, bright light in the morning, get out in the afternoon. That's fine, but wear shades and then lots of darkness at night. Eat meals regularly, and then try and exercise. Usually in the morning, if you can. If you do those three things, you can strategically treat jet lag. You can't cure it. You'll still feel a little bit miserable.、Um, the only other trick I would say is during traveling. I see a lot of people make the mistake of when they sleep during travel. It's very natural. If I'm flying over from San Francisco、um, to London, usually leave around 5 p.m. in the、yeah. evening. Most people, and let's say it's an eleven-hour flight, most people will wait until the last sort of four or three hours, and go to bed then and sort of sleep late. And I normally arrive about eleven o'clock in the morning London time. That's not the ideal thing to do. Try to sleep on your flight either in, early in the flight or in the middle of the flight. And the rule of thumb is make sure that whatever time of、uh, you want to go to bed in the new time zone that evening, let's say it's you know ten o'clock. Count back at least twelve hours or ten hours. That's the time that you have to wake up on the plane and then stay awake. You、yeah. need to build up lots of that healthy sleepiness for you to then fall asleep and stay asleep in the new time zone. Don't sleep too late into the flight. If it's late and you still haven't been sleepy, I would suggest forego sleep, which sounds strange for、wow. someone like me. Push through for the rest of the day and then just get to bed early, and you'll get into set. So thanks for sharing those tips、um, in terms of how you have tried to combat jet lag. But what's interesting, as I hear them, is that some of the tips are actually pretty similar to the recommendations you would make to people who are not crossing time zones, but are just simply trying to improve their quality of sleep.、Um, so we'll get into that in just just a, a few moments. I actually. I'm, I'm doing that flight to California relatively regularly these days, maybe three to four times a year. And two weeks ago, I went and I tried something different for the very first time. And I've got to say, I had the least jet lag I've ever had on one of my trips to California. And you know, I changed multiple variables. It's very hard to say which one exactly it was. But on the flight out there, so it was a morning flight from London, so that would be the middle of the night in California. I put on some blue light blockers on the flights, 
and blue eye blockers for a little bit of time and I was reading, but then I would close my eyes, I put a shade on my eyes and I would just try and sleep. I couldn't sleep that well, but at least I didn't expose myself to light. Then at the time of morning, or what would have been morning in California, I took off my nightshades, I did not put on my blue light blockers. And I actually watched a film, so I was exposing myself to blue light from yeah. my screen yeah. to sort of trick my body, say, hey, you're on morning time. So I've never done that before. The other thing is, and I think we'll go here next, the, the other thing I've done a lot recently is reduce my caffeine intake a lot. And I think that often when I used to travel, I was so habituated to having caffeine that sometimes I would wake up um, in the new time zone with a bit of a headache because my body was expecting caffeine earlier. It didn't have it. And I think that that was artificially waking me up. So, yeah. you know, a few things I did differently. But, you know, caffeine is such a popular topic, right? And we don't want to be... Um, you know, start off this conversation on a downer, but <laughs> you know, let's go into caffeine. I mean, how much of a sleep disruptor is caffeine? I mean, it it is quite significant, and one of the problems, um, you know, with those long haul flights. And I would actually love to speak with you know Virgin or British Airways about this. Um, they serve caffeine liberally. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing they serve is alcohol. And I'd love to speak about that too, because both of those are the very best ways to A, disrupt your sleep, and B, actually make your uh, make it much harder for your 24-hour biological circadian clock to readjust. Both of them those will, will actually take away those fingers on the wristwatch and sort of or slow the progression down. Um, but caffeine is a misunderstood drug. Certainly... It's Everyone. a drug, right? You use the term it drug, is, and that's interesting. It is a drug. Um, it's what we call a psychoactive stimulant. Um, everyone knows that caffeine can help alert you and sort of keep you awake. That's the thing that's most known. Um, caffeine, if you look at some data, is probably the second most traded commodity on the surface of the planet after oil, which I think says everything about our wow. sleep-deprived state. The other thing about caffeine, however, that most people don't realize is the time that it is in your system. So most drugs have what we call a half-life, the amount of time it takes for half of that drug to be essentially excreted out your system. Caffeine has a half-life of about six or seven hours, and it's a little dependent on what type of gene that you have to sort of metabolize the caffeine, but on average, it's about that. But what's interesting is that caffeine has a quarter life of about 12 hours. What this means is that if you have a cup of coffee at noon, a quarter of that caffeine is still circulating around your brain at midnight. Wow. So to put that in context, it would be the equivalent of getting into bed and just before you turn the light out, you swig a quarter of a cup of Starbucks and you hope for a good night of sleep. It, you know, you would never do that because, yeah. you know, but that's exactly, unfortunately, what people do, you know, um, completely innocently by drinking caffeine, you know, still too late in the afternoon. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a huge problem. It, it's, it's a, I, th I think it's a big problem in society if you, I mean, another way to quantify this is if you just look, and I've checked out the data from the Financial Times, the number of Starbucks coffee houses that have arisen <laughs> over the past 30 years is just like an exponential increase. And I think that is an expression of how we're self-medicating our state of sleep deprivation in developed nations. And well, cafe uh, culture is just, growing it you know exponentially yeah. now right it's the new you know i i talk about something it's almost like a new new pub culture it's cafe culture yeah you, know, you hang out with your friends you meet up you get your drink typically it'll be a caffeinated drink yeah um we've now got school kids you know i saw in a local village i was walking through recently you know after school you know i popped into a cafe to get i think uh, a bottle of water uh, i can't really remember but i i popped in and I saw a group of school kids, they must have been maybe 13 or 14, after school, they were sitting in the cafe with their caffeinated drinks, you know, doing their homework together, catching up or whatever. I thought, wow, you know, this has become endemic in society now. We, you know, you call it a drug. I agree with you. It is a psychoactive substance that we, you know, we, we use liberally. We let our children have it. We, you know, we're not even... You know, we often don't think about the implications of that. And so many patients of mine tell me that, Dr. Chachi, I know, you know, if caffeine can be a problem for some people, I'm not one of those. Caffeine is fine for me. But more often than not, when they either reduce their intake or cut it out completely, the sleep quality goes up. 
Yeah. And, um, I, and you know, Sachin Panda, um, Professor Panda, who, you know, I know you know very well, you both sort of follow each other's research. He was on the podcast a few weeks ago. And, you know, he was saying routinely every year he will he will have a bit of a detox from caffeine. He'll go off caffeine. And he says, when I do that, yeah, I have a headache for a few days, but my sleep always improves. I've got more energy and my productivity dramatically increases. And I think that says it all, really. It does. And, I, you know, a number of points that you made that I'd love to circle back around to. Firstly, caffeine is the only psychoactive stimulant that we do give to our children readily, which, you know, is, I think, a concern. And I'm not trying to be sort of, you know, finger pointing or finger wagging. Again, I think it's just that parents probably don't understand the impact of caffeine in that regard. Um, I think the the second point comes on to your comment of some people say, look, I'm one of those people who can drink a cup of coffee in the evening, have an espresso after dinner, and I fall asleep fine and I stay asleep. Now, even if that's true, there was an alarming study that was done where they gave people just one single cup of coffee, a dose of 200 milligrams of caffeine, standard cup of coffee. And then they measured the quality of their deep sleep by tracking these big, powerful brain waves, these glorious, beautiful, deep brain waves that bathe um, uh, all of our brain during deep sleep at night. And it helps also restore the body. And what they found was that just one dose of caffeine in the evening decreased the amount of deep sleep by 20 percent. Now, you would have to normally age by about 15 years to produce that type of a deficit in your deep sleep, or you can do it every single night by having a cup of coffee. And what's interesting is that those people will wake up the next morning. They won't remember waking up because they may not have woken up, but the quality of their deep sleep was so poor that they will still then feel unrestored and unrefreshed by their sleep. I need they, more caffeine. And, and so <laughs> here is the irony that now they're starting to reach for two cups of coffee rather than one and so develops this dependency cycle, this sort of addiction spiral, as it were. So I think people are perhaps unaware of the, the true impact of caffeine, how long it sticks around within your system. And even if you feel that you're immune to that evening cup of coffee, how it will still impact your sleep, even though consciously you know nothing about it. Well, I think, you know, you raise a really important point there, Matthew, about, you know, knowledge and awareness. You know, none of us are pointing fingers, you know, we... Yeah. You know, I understand caffeine is everywhere. You know, I probably used to overdrink caffeine uh, and I've altered my behavior as I've learned more and more about the research. And I think what we're trying to do is raise awareness of, you know, caffeine is a sleep disruptor. There's just no question about that. And, you know, we can dress it up any way we want, but it is a sleep disruptor. So if anyone is listening to this, if that story that Matthew just mentioned resonates with you, I'd really sort of encourage you to have a little think about your caffeine usage and just see if, can you, you know, can you wind it down a little bit? Can you see, you know, bit by bit, if by reducing it, it improves your quality of sleep? The recommendation I make here in my book is enjoy your caffeine before noon. If you enjoyed that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you are really going to enjoy. Blood pressure comes down, joints seem to get better, bowel symptoms seem to get better. This is going to keep your eyesight. This is going to keep you from getting dementia, renal disease, peripheral vascular disease, and cancers. You are not your habits. You can do it.